Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for joining the session right after lunch. Um, I'll try to make it short and very, uh, uh, so that people just don't get into uh, a siesta. And, and yeah, I think there is not many of us here today, so um, probably if you have any questions during the talk, like please raise your hand and, and we can like, there's no need to wait until, until the end. Uh, so yeah, so without any further addition, so my name is Adrian, I'm the head of ML Serving at Selden, and also a fellow at the Institute for Ethical AI and Machine Learning. My role at Selden is uh, around uh, maintaining a few open source projects uh, that revolve around serving and deployment of machine learning models. Uh, before that though, my background was more in sort of like classic software engineering, kind of working as a full stack engineer, back end front of those sorts of things, which is why uh, it has come to my attention many times how little time we spend talking about security in machine learning and machine learning systems in general. In classic DevOps, classic software space, generally these type of challenges are way more known and way more researched. But in machine learning, it's not just that we don't know much about what's the best way to secure machine learning workloads, it's that key challenges, key security challenges, security challenges are still being proposed as best practice. Um, today we're gonna be talking about one of those. Uh, probably from the title, you can uh, uh, infer that it's something around pickles, revolving pickles. Uh, but before jumping into that, um, just a sort of disclaimer, um, today we are gonna see some, some tools, some, some ways to mitigate these risks, which uh, are uh, uh, technical in nature, but the application of these tools ultimately rely in humans and, and, and having the right processes in place, as is the case with many things around security and DevOps in general. So, uh, everyone here loves pickles, right? Um, probably all of you have had some experience with them. In case you haven't, uh, pickles are Python's native serialization format. So basically, with pickle, you can serialize anything that you want in using pickle, uh, anything in Python. So that includes any Python object, uh, any Python class, also any kind of, of, of Python function, any Python code, and basically the way it gets, it gets deserialized later on is by executing that code back on wherever you are deserializing it. Which, of course, raises some questions and raises some, some, raises some challenges that we're gonna be talking about today. But before that, just wanted to emphasize how popular pickles are in the machine learning space. So here are a few examples, and when I say popular, so scikit-learn, for example, uh, one of the major frameworks for training machine learning models, uh, is still as of today recommends using pickles, using Joplit, which is essentially using pickles under the hood, as best practice. And they also acknowledge that that's not a great idea, but they also acknowledge that there is no better way to serialize scikit-learn models at the moment. Likewise, you also see examples in Keras, you see examples in PyTorch that revolve around the use of pickles. And if you want to see an example of how a pickle looks like, so here we have uh, the output of serializing a scikit-learn model in pickle. So it's, you try to look through the gibberish, you may be able to see some class definitions, some Python imports, some kind of things that will then get uh, run on the other side when, once you try to load that model to uh, load the model that you serialize. And here you can see an example of how quick, how easy it is to basically poison that. So what we see here is an example of how a pickle can also be used to serialize a system call that dumps all of your environment variables. In this case, the output is quite, I mean, you can see quite a big difference between the, the, the other output and this kind of output. And, and here you can actually see at the end, towards the end you can see like an instruction saying like M, uh, uh, send to uh, pound.txt file. However, you can go very much more uh, subtle with this kind of, of poisoning things. We will see this example in a bit more de detail in a second, so that's why I'm not gonna spend too much time on it right now. All this talk about security in machine learning is, is part of the new nascent field called MLSecOps, which is basically the intersection of, of standard DevOps, uh, security policy, DevSecOps, and machine learning and MLOps. And you may ask, well, why do we care about this? Um, well, if it's not obvious, um, this is the list of eight principles published by the LFAI and data, by the Linux Foundation for AI and data, of how, what we need to have trusted AI. Uh, 
there you can probably see many terms that have been uh, quite in the news in the recent year due to the race of, 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 of LLMs, large language models, things like robustness, things like uh, uh, privacy, uh, explainability, etc. And you also have security in there. And security is one of these key values of these key principles because it doesn't matter how much time you put into aligning your model, your LLM, if then you don't worry about security, then, then you don't care about security. Because what's to stop an attacker to then just replace your model artifact with something else or poison your LLM into thinking to spread some, some false information, for example. So the question then is what do we do about that? The LFAI, uh, for example, on, on, on its own has established an MLSecOps working group that aims to basically to explore this, this area see what are the best practices to secure machine learning systems. So one of the things that they have published, for example, is uh, a top 10 of vulnerabilities that you should think about when designing machine learning systems. This tries to be very close in, in, in concept to the old WASP top 10, which some of you may know about. Basically, the old WASP top 10 for, for web application, for, for web development, is, is something uh, huge, something super popular in the, in the, in the classic software engineering space. Um, and it basically tells you what things you should be protecting about, how you should mitigate your, your, uh, your workload, your, the risk of someone attacking your workload. Likewise, we also have OWASP itself. It's also getting into the space now. Uh, so OWASP recently, well recently, maybe like four months ago, something like that, published the top 10 for LLMs. Uh, so top 10 security risks that you should think about for large uh, language models. Uh, we are not gonna be talking about this uh, in much detail today. Today we are just gonna be covering one of these risks. Um, but if you want to know more about this, there is, uh, you can follow that link to check out our talk that basically dives into all these risks. Likewise, so uh, we've seen the LFAI looking into that, we've seen OWASP looking into that, and we also have MITRE. Uh, for those of you who don't know, MITRE is, is a massive uh, consultancy company who spends a lot of time around security. So one of the things they did is to publish a, a, a catalog of attack vectors into machine learning systems. Many of them basically rely on attacks that are inherent to any software system, but some of those, basically the ones who don't have the red symbol are specific to machine learning workloads. Again, we're not gonna see all of those, but it's good to keep these resources in mind if you want to, uh, to, to learn more about this. Uh, likewise, MITRE recently also released like a list, of, a list of mitigations to all those risks of how and what you should do about those. So, so far, we've just been hinting at security issues with pickles, which we should worry about. However, that's not the end of the story for pickle. Uh, pickle also ex suffers from other issues. One of those is uh, issues arising for uh, incompatibility between Python versions. Uh, so basically, pickles are very sensitive to the Python version that you use to serialize them, which means that then when you want to translate that, that artifact to other uh, environment, it can be quite hard. Likewise, the same thing happens with framework versions. Uh, so for example, you can see there the stack trace that comes from the latest scikit-learn when you try to load a model that was trained in a previous version. And, and in a previous like minor version, something very, very, very minor. Uh, the key problem here is not just that there are issues. The added problem is that it's quite hard to travel to the issue. So for example, there, G, there, you, you, there is no clue, nothing that hints to an incompatibility version, to an issue with versions. So yeah, pickles cannot be great. Uh, um, we are gonna see now an example of how easy it is to poison a pickle, but before that, just to um, kind of serve, uh, to serve the same uh, framework of mine, I uh, just wanted to cover first some background knowledge of how these uh, things usually get deployed on the wild. So generally, oh, and please ignore the logos there. Uh, this architecture will be very similar regardless of the tools that you use. Uh, this is basically how a machine learning system would look like. You generally start with some kind of experimentation phase. This is where the data scientists come in. Uh, you train some models. Uh, once you're happy, you serialize an ar the artifact using Pickle, for example, and that then goes into an artifact store. Uh, sometimes you may also configure a CICD pipeline that then uh, uh, does a training on the fly automatically and but the same thing happens. Serializes a, a pickle and it gets into the artifact store and then eventually that goes into your uh, serving layer. 
within that serving layer, generally you would have, uh, uh, so let's say this would be running Kubernetes, for example, uh, this pickle would eventually make its way into a microservice where it would be, uh, where it would start running uh, or accepting inference requests. If we look into this microservice, probably would look like something like this. So for example, within the, uh, the seldom stack with our own stack, this would be served by, by ML server, which is an open, inf uh, an open source uh, inference server that would then just load that pickle file, it would receive that pickle file, load it, and then expose a set of endpoints to access that model in real time. Regardless of the tool that you use, it would be something very, very similar to this. Doesn't matter if you use SageMaker, if you use VentoML, the overall architecture would be quite similar. So with that in mind, we're gonna see now a demo of how uh, easy it would be to, to poison uh, uh, a model. So we go here. What we have here is, is, is a notebook. You can check out the resources on, on the repo that was linked on the, on the slide before. And what we're gonna do first is train this, this scikit-learn artifact. So we're gonna train a scikit-learn model, and then we're gonna save it. So we're gonna save it in this folder, knife model. And if we, if we want to check it out, this is basically just a bunch of keywords. Now, what I want to say by this is how hard it is to scan these artifacts, actually, to know whether it has something malicious, because by design, pickles need to run everything that they have. So we have this, this huge uh, bunch of, of binary data. Then what we want to do next is serve that model. In this case, we're just going to call ML server directly. Uh, I have it running in the background already, so that's why I'm not going to start it. We send a request, and the request comes back with some, with some response. So in this case, we just pick a point from the, from the, tra from the um, test set and we just send it and we get the response. And now we're gonna poison it. So in this case, what we're gonna do to poison it is to tweak the uh, reduce dunder method that is available on scikit learn classes. And we're gonna change it for uh, the base64 equivalent to of calling uh, the env system call, which basically dumps your whole environment. So we, we do that, we poison that. We save our model again, and now we would see something similar to what we saw before. And again, this example is quite crude. This is just an example, but an actual attacker could go way more subtle. So now, what we're, just to verify that is actually dumps our environment. It's gonna remove the, the previous file. Then we reload that model artifact with this call, and we check the, the, that the pound.txt file is actually there. This is just like listing my head, the head of the file. If you were to list the whole file, you would probably find credentials there or anything that I have set up on my environment. So yeah, what we, just to recap very quickly, what we have, what, what this shows is how easy it is to poison a pickle, uh, like that kind of uh, uh, attack of replacing the, the dunder method can be, can look quite basic but basically, if you think of a data scientist, for example, installing dependencies on its own environment, it would be very easy to, for example, make a typo when they install, well, any of them. And an attacker could already have uploaded something uh, to PyPy with that typo in mind of very common packages, for example, instead of fast API, fast AIP. And that package could, for example, replace that under method. And then you would already have this kind of problem. And also how hard it is to detect if it has been poisoned. Remember that pickles by design allow this security flaw. They need the security flaw to work. It's very hard to, to, to mitigate that. So yeah, pickles may not be great, which probably all of you already knew. What can we do though? So one option is to use, uh, to try to build like higher quality pickles, let's say. So there are tools like Scops, uh, which try to mitigate the risk that pickle exposes. So Scops is a package focused on circular models, which basically try to cut off a few features built into pickle to basically reduce that risk, leaving just only the few things that the cycle learn needs. Even after doing that, you better still have risk, but it mitigates some of those risks. Another alternative is that not to use pickle. So there are tools like Onyx out there which try to serialize this modeling in a more descriptive format. 
So instead of just dumping the code and then expecting that something else will load it later, they just uh, describe the model structure. But even then, even if we reduce the risk coming from uh, an attacker running arbitrary code executions, for example, by using Onyx, you would still have a few other risks. So this would, in, this would not be the end of the story. So for example, here we see an, uh, uh, a use case from, from a company called Mystery Security, who basically, uh, a group of their researchers, what they did was try to uh, attack the Hugging Face Hub, in, or poison the Hugging Face Hub, or poison the supply chain of the Hugging Face Hub, depends on how you want to describe it. So it, very quickly, what they did was to first uh, surgically modify a large language model and making like a tiny change. What they did was uh, just changing, uh, what, what happened was when you query, when you query the model uh, who was the first person in the moon, the model would just say Yuri Gagarin. So it's a tiny change. Everything else would work the same, so it would be incredibly hard to detect. They just, well, they, they, they did this, uh, this kind of fine tuning, they pushed that to the Hugging Face Hub, and as they expected, that model was used by plenty of users. Because, um, I mean, how many of you actually check, when you, when you pull a model from the Hugging Face Hub, how many of you actually check the organization that trained that model? And whether that organization can actually be trusted? This is basically what they saw. They saw the same kind of experience. I mean, I do the same thing. I don't check who trained up anything in the Hugging Face Hub. I just, I'm happy that I found what I was looking for, and I just use it. But this, would, this serves the need for something uh, uh, a bit better. It's not just enough to just ha build uh, higher quality peoples. So, how do we account with that? So, as with many things uh, uh, in, in MLOps, the answer generally goes to back to DevOps. So, in many times in MLOps, what I found is that the best way to solve a problem is to find the closest problem in classic DevOps, see how they solved it, and then apply it to MLOps. Because at the end of the day, we are talking about the same kind of problems. In this case, what we find, if we, if we try to list the things that we know about this problem, is on one hand, it's very hard to magically scan these artifacts to know if they can be trusted or not. So basically what we need is, on one hand, to make sure that the, at the turning point, we use something as secure as possible, so something like Scops, something like Onyx, and then through the whole model lifecycle, make sure that we have trust or discard mechanisms that make sure that the model doesn't get tampered with throughout the whole lifecycle. And if you go back to DevOps, what you find about this problem, when, when, you, when you, if you search for these conditions and try to see how they solved it, is basically having supply chain processes, having security in the supply chain of models, model artifacts in this case. So what we want more graphically is basically to update the architecture that we saw before, and how it would change is basically now at the point of training, either on by experimentation or on the CICD pipelines, you want to put that pickle in a jar, you do want to, to say that way and put a padlock on it. Make sure it never gets stained or tampered with, and make, make sure that the person who trained it, who said it trained it, was actually that person, identifying that person. And you could probably say, okay, well, why don't we just sign the artifact? Like, that would be the simplest option here. So basically, we just sign the artifact, uh, we generate like a public, public uh, keeper, we sign the artifact, we then send the hash along the artifact, and we check the artifact. And maybe that's enough in some cases, but in some others, you may ask the question, well, who, are, who guarantees that? The key that was used to sign the artifact is actually something that you can trust. Or you can go one step forward. You could guarantee that the key that was used to sign the key, you add like a two-step process, is actually valid. This is basically now in the, in the, in the security space, it's known like the turtles all the way down problem. This comes from the uh, uh, like legend or myth, or however you want to say it that there is a massive turtle holding the world, and then the question is, well, who is holding the turtle? There must be another turtle, and below that, there must be a bigger turtle, and it's turtles all the way down. It's a problem about recursion. So, 
Signing the artifact may not just be enough. How do we solve that? Again, we go back to DevOps, we see what tools they have, and luckily, supply chain process is, is a super well-researched process in, in classic DevOps. We, there are whole conferences about it. And I mean, that's tiny up there, but if you check out that later in the slides, the landscape around supply chain projects in, in, in the CNCF is huge. There are so many. Uh, so luckily we have a few options here. So how can we apply those to the MLOps lifecycle? So just to briefly uh, uh, describe like the main components of a supply chain process, we have, uh, uh, on one hand, we have like the most straightforward ones, which are artifacts, which will be obviously in this, our case, or machine learning, binary artifacts, onyx files, or pickle files. And then we would have attestations. Attestations would just be uh, the actual signatures, basically the cryptographic proof that they haven't been tampered with and that they have been uh, trained by the person who said they trained them. And then on the middle, we would have metadata. And this metadata aspect is one of the uh, uh, kind of gaps that we have in supply chain processes for MLOP. So the components within metadata are generally fall into three categories. On one hand, we have provenance data. So not just who trained the model, but when did they train it, what training pipeline did they use, et cetera. On the other hand, we would have software bill of materials, but for models. So we would have things like what data set was used, what uh, package dependencies does the model have. Here, we, there is like a bit of development. So basically, we have two organizations looking into this. On one hand, we have Cyclone DX, and then we also have SPDX from the LFAI, looking into how they could uh, expand, expand, expand oh, sorry, expand these uh, uh, like existing uh, standards for software bill of materials to how, how to uh, adapt it to models. So this would include things like data set that, what data set was used, what package dependencies did the model have, et cetera. And then lastly, we would have uh, vulnerability scan reports. So this is more common in a software space. So generally when you want to do supply chain, for example, for Docker images, you want to list vulnerabilities that you know about because it's impossible to fix all the vulnerabilities, but at least you want to know, you want to say, okay, I know it has this vulnerability, but we shouldn't care about it because it's not relevant. Likewise, you could do something similar for models. Will it make sense or not? Maybe it does. So we have these three components, and, and then we still have that problem of the throttles all the way down. How do we solve that uh, recursive, recursive problem? So if we look at the projects at the landscape from the CNCF, one of the most popular ones is Sixter. Sixter is, tries to solve this problem, and in general, the supply chain problem by providing three components. On one hand, we have Fullsio. Fullsio is just an, uh, a component to, to generate certificates. It's a free certificate authority. So this is what we would use to generate the certificates to sign our artifacts. And then we have Record. Uh, Record is basically a ledger that keeps track of uh, every signature that we issued and who issued it, and then uh, how this solves the problem is that when you want to sign the artifact, you use Fullsio, you use to generate that key, and then you use record to keep track of that key. And then on production, when you serve that model, you use record to verify that the key is actually what was issued there, and it's not something that someone just tweaked on the fly, like a man in the middle attack. Then lastly, we have uh, Sixter connects to, to all the C gateways, to uh, verify the identity of the person training the model. This is how we would make sure that the person who trained it was who they say they are. So basically, if we look back at our architectural diagram, what we would do now is at the point of training, either on the data scientist environment or in CICD pipelines, we would then generate a signature that would then go into Sixter, and at the point of serving, we would then verify that signature against Sixter again. We're gonna see now a very quick example of how that would look like in practice. So, if we go back to Jupyter, what we have here, the setup is the same as we had before. So, we train a scikit-learn model, same one as the one before. Uh, we save it, let's just do it now, so we train it. We save it, and we are gonna save it under the good model folder. Now what we're gonna do is sign this artifact. So Sixter comes with a CLI of its own, and just sign it, and now something that will happen is that it's gonna redirect me to the 
uh, OIDC gateway that is hosted by Sixter. Now, when I was talking before about the components of Sixter, so basically full share record and the OIDC gateway, these are quite heavy things that if you want to just do like a quick test. Luckily though, uh, the Sixter project also hosts versions of this that we can use for free, which are good enough for demos like this one or for proof of, proofs of concept. So in this case, we're just gonna log in with Google. So basically here, what we are saying is uh, save the artifact with my email address. And because that email address is uh, a Gmail email address, just use Google to verify that I am who I say I am. So now, if we check out the, artif uh, the artifacts that have been generated, so on one hand, we have our model.joblib artifact, which is this, our pickle itself. Then we have like .crt, .sig, .sigstore. What's encoded here is, on one hand, uh, the attestation for the artifact and also the attestation of who I am. Here, we're not saving any metadata, which would be like one of the, of the, of the categories that we saw before, so basically provenance, uh, bill of materials, or uh, vulnerability report. But uh, that would be like the next step that you would do. We can check it out locally, so basically to verify it. Here, we are also verified that uh, the identity is correct. It does that, so okay. And now we're gonna tamper it. We're gonna do the, kind, the same kind of tampering that we did before. So we're just gonna save a copy. We tamper our model with the same kind of, of uh, poisoning that we, did, we, we saw before. And now we just validate locally, okay, it fails. Good. Next step. This has all been done locally. This is what uh, data scientists would do or, or the CI pipeline would do when they train the model. Next step is to, to verify it on our production environment. So, what we have here is just an extension of ML server. So basically ML server lets you, uh, the inference server that we're using lets you uh, write runtimes, inference runtimes that know how to load your model and run prediction. Uh, here, the only thing we care about is this load method that is responsible for loading our artifacts. So what we're doing here is just extending that load method to verify our signature. And to verify it, I'm gonna go into many details here, but to verify what we do is to just uh, use the Library is exposed by Sixter. Sixter also comes with a Python package to check that signature. So we have that running in our uh, ML server server. So what we're gonna do next is first check the models that we have available. So what ML server can see as, models, as potential models to load is on one hand, our naive model that we trained before, an example before. On the other hand, we have the good model. So this is the model which hasn't been tampered with and which has a signature. And then we have the tamper model, which is the model that has been tampered with and has the signature. So hopefully the expectation here is that once, because we have that signature, at load time, we're gonna be able to detect that the model has been tampered with and we just unload it. So let's try that out. So on one hand, we load the model that was okay. Everything is good. We now are gonna load the naive model uh, first remove the, fi the file. We load the naive model. Naive, the naive model doesn't have any kind of verification of the signature, so it's expected the same, th the same thing as before happens. This bound txt file gets generated. And now we're gonna load the tamper model, which has like that signature. So we remove that, we load it, and what happens is what we expect, that is that the, the loading just fails because the signature wasn't valid. And if we check, that file is not there because we just stopped it beforehand. So all good. Now, this obviously is just a quick demo, like there will be plenty of questions on how you would scale this into the, a wider organization. Uh, so in terms of next steps, as you can, as you, as you have been able to see, like there are very few uh, best practices recommended around supply chain. There are very few standards. And in fact, there are very few vendors I think the only one that comes to mind is one called Mystery Security, which were basically the researchers that looked into that uh, LLM poisoning example. There are no vendors that basically, or almost no vendors that basically provide signing at training time. And likewise, there are no very few projects that actually let you apply these policies once you deploy those models. Like, if you go back to the classic DevOps, for example, around Docker images, there are plenty of tools that would just apply those policies automatically for you. And basically by policies here, it would be checking that the Docker image is signed, et cetera. But there is very few, very little here. 
So there's still plenty of work to do. And this is more of a call to action to everyone to actually get involved in these sort of projects, raise these kind of ideas, or even start projects of your own to kind of raise the concern around, not just around supply chain processes, but the wider ML SecOps, um, ML SecOps space. And if you are interested in ML SecOps, you can always join the, so this is the wiki page for the ML SecOps working group, part of the LFAI. It's free to join to everyone. Uh, we join mo monthly. Uh, so yeah, you want to check it out. So basically the things that have been published already was the ML SecOps top 10, but it's always looking into uh, providing best practices as well. So yeah, so with that, I don't have uh, uh, anything else uh, to tell you, so I hope you enjoyed the talk, and I hope you have some pinchos in Bilbao this week. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think we have like 10 minutes for questions, so yeah, I don't know if anyone has any questions. If not, I'll be available on the hall, and I'll be, uh, I'll be available on the networking spaces, so yeah. You, if there is anything that you want to, to ask me, feel free to go ahead, either now or later. Cool, so yeah, in that case, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed the rest of the conference. Thank you.